to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore coming at you from Breckenridge, Colorado. Today on the show, we have a uh, guest from the Netherlands. Uh, we are talking today about an upcoming conference in the Netherlands called ICPR 2020. I'm going to be there. Very excited. And today we have the executive director of the conference. His name is Joost Brexima. I may have butchered the last name, but I, I think I nailed the first name. We really were excited to have him on. He's been quite active in the psychedelic space, and this conference looks to be quite exciting. So we're going to have probably a few more uh, folks from the conference on the podcast in the next few weeks, and really excited about that. We've been uh, able to form a media partnership with the conference and Really excited. So we, we talk all about the conference, talk about the scene in Europe, and, and go a little bit all over the map. So really excited about this episode, and I hope you enjoy it. Very excited to be in Amsterdam, if you, or Netherlands. I think it's in Harlem. Harlem? Harlem? <laughs> Pronunciation is going to be tough for me, but I promise I will get better as I get to know the Netherlands better. This will be my first time in the Netherlands, and and really, really stoked. It's a it's a very sciencey conference. Um, Alicia Danforth, UCLA researcher, is going to be there. Wade Davis, a pioneering anthropologist, uh, direct student of uh, Richard Evan Schultz's from Harvard, uh, will be there. He's currently a professor at uh, University of British Columbia, I believe, and I believe a National Geographic explorer in residence. Um, and has been for a long time. Really, really cool guy. I really appreciate Wade's work and contribution to the field of um, ethnobotany, anthropology, and, and ayahuasca in general. And his critique on the, uh, the cocaine situation in uh, the Amazon is also quite interesting. It's uh, quite devastating to the habitat. And um, I'd, I'd like to discuss if it's more an issue of... Um, prohibition causing these problems as po- like because people have to kind of cut new forest and leave every couple of weeks or however long that process is and it's more and more rainforest gets destroyed as opposed to you know perhaps permanent facilities you know fair trade cocaine who knows um i i'd like to discuss that with wade and maybe we can get into it we're we're working on getting wade davis on the show and and others from the conference as well so stay tuned you're going to hear more about this conference over the next few months and if you want to go, check it out, icpr2020.com, uh, .net, sorry, sorry, icpr2020.net. So check it out, icpr2020.net. Um, you'll hear a bunch about it from us, probably some emails and social media posts. So if you're in Europe, come on over. If you're uh, free in um, April, maybe come over to uh, the Netherlands and, and meet me and, and say hi. All right, so that's it for the intro. Uh, really excited for you. This episode is brought to you by Onnit, O-N-N-I-T dot com, and get a uh, 10% off anything but fitness equipment uh, with the code PSY today at checkout, P-S-Y today, O-N-N-I-T dot com. I'm a big fan of their supplements, great stuff. I really want to try more of their stuff, but I've, I've probably been ordering from them for well over 10 years now. Great company. I really like what they do and, and their mission. Uh, check it out. Again, O-N-N-I-T dot com and code PSY today, P-S-Y today at checkout for a 10% off discount. And also brought to you by Audible. If you want a free book, free audio book and a 30-day free trial to Audible, go over to audibletrial.com slash psychedelics today or psychedelics today.com slash welcome and you just click a link and you can check out tons of different psychedelic titles. The recent book about mescaline by Mike J is wonderful. Um, there's a bunch of Terrence McKenna up there, Tim Leary books, a uh, book called Drugged by Richard Miller is extraordinary. I learned so much about chemistry and the pharma um, trade just by reading that book. It's it's pretty much like all the drugs that we use today and well, not all of them, but a lot of the major drugs that we use today, their history, like how they how they came uh, to be. A lot of it had to do with um, uh, dye, like textile dyes and, and whatnot. And, um, and people just found out that they had uh, uh, interesting interactions with the human body over time. So yeah, very interesting stuff. Again, drugged by Richard Miller. There's so many books out there. Just go over to audible.com, check it out. If you want to sign up, audibletrial.com slash psychedelics today. And it helps us quite a bit if you sign up. On a celebratory note, we were able to sell out two full classes of 
navigating psychedelics for clinicians and therapists. And I was able to totally sell out a breathwork workshop in Breckenridge. I'm really excited about that. 14 people are going to be here next weekend and super excited. Can't wait to share the work with more folks. So I think that's it for now. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just get rolling. Enjoy this episode with Yosht from ICPR and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today, everybody. Today in the show, we have Joost from ICPR 2020, an upcoming exciting conference in Amsterdam. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, really excited too. So you're, you're with the Open Foundation and have been working really hard on this ICPR 2020 conference. Before we dig into the conference, can you tell us a little bit about your, yourself and your background with psychedelics? Sure. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm Joost. I'm the director of the Open Foundation, which is an uh, independent NGO that we started in 2007, really with a basic goal to stimulate academic interest and research into psychedelics in the Netherlands. And one of the main things that we've been doing is organizing events such as uh, the upcoming conference. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, yeah, um, uh, I was just going to add my, my background is in philosophy. I'm currently doing qualitative research into the experiences of people um, being given a psychedelic for the treatment of a mental disorder. So, yeah, my, my interest in, in psychedelics really comes from my background in philosophy. I've, uh, I've studied William James, which is an often mentioned name in the, uh, I mean, among people who are interested in psychedelics and consciousness. And that's really how I became interested in psychedelics as well. That's really great. William James is a you know, really in- inspiring figure if you read him right. Absolutely. Yeah. So he certainly a philosopher too, like scientist philosopher, you know, it'd be wonderful if we could inspire more scientists to pick up philosophy, but that's a project that we're working on, but we'll, we'll see how that shakes out. Yeah. It's interesting. I I always imagined that philosophy would have so much to say about, about psychedelics and the states of consciousness induced by psychedelics, but still there's relatively little serious philosophical research into the psychedelics or related to psychedelics, I find. Right. I, I know Peter Swarstead Hughes um, from from the UK has done a lot of pretty serious work. And there's one gentleman from Australia, but I don't I don't know his name. I I very much like to talk to him uh, once I remember his name. But yeah, is it Chris Lethby? That sounds correct. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah. So there is some, but not not that much. Right. So someday, someday. So the Open Foundation was open to do more psychedelic research in. The Netherlands. What kind of research have you done with the Open Foundation? Yeah, basically, just just as a as a as a background. So, the 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 idea of the foundation was really started in in two thousand six, when we went to the um, this this beautiful conference in in Basel, Switzerland, that was organized on the occasion of Albert Hoffman's centennial birthday, and this is the first time uh, many of us, the people who founded the organization, came into contact with serious psychedelic research and we realized there was nobody from the Netherlands. This was a huge conference, 2,000 people. I don't know if you attended, but this was very, very inspirational. And the fact that nobody from the Netherlands was doing any research into psychedelics really put us on the track of, okay, getting getting this research off the ground uh, in our country, which has traditionally had a very liberal tolerance stance towards drugs, not a very moralistic view at least. And we've had it. We have a history of, of psychedelic research, and only now, only now is that starting up again. I, uh, on our advisory board, we have a researcher named Maline, who I believe was at the University of Maastricht doing five MEO DMT research, and, mm-hmm. and I hope that's how you say the city name. Uh, but <laughs> pretty impressive. Yes, <laughs> All <right>. correct. <laughs> All right, good. Um, but yeah, it's it's really interesting to see that people are able to spin up these projects. In this, in the U.S., it, it seems like it takes years to set up to get any kind of permission. So it's nice to have this kind of geographical diversity of people who can actually jump in. And I, you know, you the laws in your country allow for some very interesting, you know, substances to not be scheduled or illegal. So like that's that should help. But actually, I haven't seen too much research. Is there are there people researching truffles? No, nobody's doing any research at truffles, at least not that I'm aware of. Right. And I think I would know. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's still it's not that different from the US in terms of regulation. I think mm. it's even the, the same substances are uh, that are illegal in the states are illegal in the Netherlands, and we have the same legislation, the same regulatory burdens that people the, uh, the, the, the hoops that people have to jump through in order to do research. But the University of Maastricht in particular has been doing research for uh, for a number of years, a lot of different substances. So they have, I mean, they're, they're one of the, the few university that, universities that have a tradition in researching all kinds of illegal psychopharmacological substances, including psychedelics now. Mm. Good. That's interesting. Great. Now, did you encounter, like, was the reading of William James the first time you kind of got really interested in the psychedelic stuff or, or was it around in your world before William James? Yeah, that's a good question. It's always this interest, these different interests seem to combine. And uh, I think actually that reading William James was a result of my fascination in psychedelics mm -hmm. and starting to find, starting to find who had anything serious to say about it from a philosophical point of view. And then inevitably you, you stumble upon William James, I think. Somebody, somebody who has done a very serious exploration of, of alternate or alternative or altered states of consciousness, uh, very systematically. And as as a, as, a, as an example, I mean, as a rule, philosophers are not always the best writers. But William James has this capacity that he knows how to put into words beautifully what he's experienced and what he's writing about, and it makes uh, makes for a really interesting reading as well. Uh, varieties of, of religious experiences is a, it's a seriously thick book. It's dense, but it's also very readable. So that makes it even even better to study this. Right. It's it's such a great book, and you're right about him being a great writer. Uh, he had he had quite the childhood. So I I advise people go read about him <laughs> if you haven't, because the story is pretty incredible. I, essentially, founding psychology in America, at least mm -hmm. at Harvard and. I don't remember when, probably late 1800s, I, but um, yeah. dates are a little rough. True. Cool. So, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's jump into this ICPR 2020. I, I have been noticing that there haven't been too many big or really any academic conferences at the larger scale in uh, the Netherlands, but this looks like it's going to happen and it looks like it's going to be pretty big. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So this, this, will, be, this will actually be our fourth uh, academic conference on psychedelics. First one was in 2010, and we've done a, a few other ones with a few years in between. The last one was in 2016. But yeah, this will be the biggest and the most interesting, I, I think, to date next year. That's wonderful. Is the focus um, purely kind of quantitative research, or is there any kind of specific angle? No, that's... Our conferences have always been both, I think, academic in nature and uh, interdisciplinary. And for, for important reasons, I think since, uh, since we started with the Open Foundation, our focus has always been purely scientific. Uh, many, many other uh, conferences on psychedelics, they include aspects of psychedelic culture, of music, of art. And we always felt that it's important for this field to be taken seriously to focus strictly on the, on the serious academic research. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is also at the same time, it is really interdisciplinary. I mean, the name says it. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary conference on psychedelic research, which is purposefully uh, kind of kind of a boring title. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, we, we kind of do it on purpose. Um, it's, it's partly due to what, uh, I don't know if you know, Andrew Sewell, who was a researcher uh, who no. passed away, unfortunately, a couple of years ago. He spoke at our first conference, and we discussed his interest in, um, in parapsychology. And he said, he, he told me, that always stuck with me, that um, you can only be deviant in one way. So if you're interested in psychedelics, it's also already a little bit of a fringe um, topic in science. So that's, that's okay if it's only one thing. But if it's also um, an interest in parapsychology, or if you also look like a hippie, then it makes it really hard to be taken seriously. So we try, we try on purpose to be a little bit boring. Mm -hmm. um, and we find we find that if the topic is psychedelics in in practice or in reality, it's never it's never boring. But we do include all aspects of uh, all all academic disciplines that seriously study psychedelics. 
Mm. Which is what which is one of the aspects of psychedelics that most fascinate me. I mean, there's very few academic disciplines um, that you could not study psychedelics from. That was one of the things that made me uh, feel pretty secure about launching psychedelics today. I said, I, this field is so broad that I could really never get bored. There's too many sub angles to co come at it from. Um, I'm totally. looking at your speaker list right now. And you've got some phenomenal folks on there. Wade Davis yeah. being, you know, quite amazing. Uh, I've been exchanging some emails with him. So thank you for making that connection. And Alicia Danforth. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, I'm personally really looking forward to Wade Davis. Yeah, he, he's I, extraordinary. I, he is. Yeah, um, yeah is this, yeah, is this like literary character almost? <laughs> like this, yeah. this <laughs> Indiana Jones like explorer. And one one river a book that he wrote about uh, uh, explorations of Richard Evans Schultz is one of my favorite books. It's amazing, and I'm really happy to have him speak at the conference. Right, yeah, it's almost like he's extended that career of um, Schultz's and you know made it very much you know extended. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the the list is great here. You've got uh, Michael Mithoff, or Alicia Danforth, Matt Johnson. Janice Phelps from CIIS, Mendel Kalin. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. I'll, I'll get to meet him. <laughs> Perfect. And Torsten Passy. Yeah. It's amazing. It's a great list of people um, you've got mm -hmm. here. And that's just the start. Yeah, the list is, the list, it, it's not even complete yet. I think we'll, we'll have over 80 speakers and mm -hmm. some poster presenters uh, over the course of the three days. We'll have some, we'll, we'll have some pre-conference workshops as well. Um, we haven't, we haven't, finalize the details, but I think Mendel will be doing a music music workshop, music as slash for therapy uh, all day workshop before the conference, and we'll have some additional workshops uh, aimed at clinicians as well, uh, micro phenomenology workshop, none of, none of which has been announced, so uh, we'll be announcing those in the coming weeks and months once we get the details clear. Great. That's fantastic. And do you expect uh, it to be pretty international in terms of people coming to attend? Yeah, and in, in my experience, uh, or in our experience, the, the the people that have attended our conferences have been usually divided roughly equally between Dutch attendees and, and international people. So half half roughly will be from abroad, half again roughly will be will be Dutch, and same it will be like half students, half professionals. More or less. Yeah, that's great. I' pretty excited to meet um, kind of the European side of things. I've, you know, been more like New York and California, and not really connecting physically with uh, too many Europeans involved in this stuff. And it's pretty exciting. There's a whole it's a world out there. Yeah. 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 Totally. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, is there anything in particular about the conference that gets you really excited? Like, is there? Um, any kind of like beyond Wade Davis, is there going to be kind of like a panel that you're looking at or, or anything that's like really exciting to you or, or anything else? Uh, there's a, there's a couple of things. So one of the things we're organizing, which is maybe not the most relevant for, um, for this audience, but for us will be really important is we're organizing a, a satellite symposium on Friday, a small scale symposium intended at Dutch psychiatrists, psychotherapists, which will focus exclusively on, clinical research and psycho psychotherapy with psychedelics. So this was, we'll, we'll ask all the speakers who are doing any clinical work to fill a full day that will hopefully acquaint interested, uh, but a little bit edgy psychiatrists, clinical psychologists, psychotherapists with an interest in, in, um, in psychedelics to basically learn more about what is happening in this, in this field. Um, but beyond that, it's important. Yeah, it's very important. And I, I noticed we organized um, a symposium on psychedelic research last year at the at the big Dutch National Associations for Psychiatry. Um, this was the this was the most popular side track, which was surprising to us. We figured they put us in some small room, but we had a like this one thousand people room that was over two thirds filled. So we noticed we we know there's an interest in in people who work in, in the treatment of, of mental disorders in psychedelics. So we're hoping this will make it more likely for them to attend a conference on psychedelics, which they might not, might not be interested in 
in a three-day conference that also includes anthropology and philosophy and, and botany, for example, but they might if it's aimed directly at, uh, at clinical work, clinical research. Mm. Yeah, that's great. I do find that uh, psychiatrists are, are really short on time. And I, I understand that they like uh, really compressed information. You yeah. know, I think to to somebody like me, I, I just feel like I have to unpack a lot more because you know I can say something, but there's really a hundred things behind that that make that true. So it's not, you know, it's really hard in a few hours. But you know, they, You're they need to get started somewhere, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And yeah do you know if sure. it'll be providing kind of credits towards their licenses? Yeah, I will. Oh, yeah. excellent. Yeah. That's so, but this is this is so this is only for a small audience. So, you no, know, as I said, we do we do focus on the um, on academic research and scientific research and presenting uh, results, research methodologies. But we also think, especially at this point point in time, it's really important to have a, a critical discussion on the direction of psychedelic research, psychedelic treatments. You know what what. What do the current developments mean in terms of accessibility or inclusivity um, for for patients, but also for non-patients? So, you know, the, there's been a lot of discussion about processes of, of mainstreaming psychedelics or medicalization of psychedelics, and what 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 are the consequences of that? I mean, it's it's easy to say that it's uh, it's research and we'll follow the research, but this will have implications for society as well and i think it's really important to discuss to discuss those openly um, with an open mind so we're, we're, we're currently thinking about how to how to address those in, in panel discussions uh, and how to do that openly and that's that's something that i really look forward to this can i mean these can be difficult discussions maybe sometimes but it's really important to have those i think yeah it's a really hot topic and we were at the Horizons conference this October, and there was a panel discussion with folks from, you know, Compass Pathways and Synthesis, maybe, and a few other spots. And it mm -hmm. was an interesting conversation, though, you know, like I was just saying, it wasn't long enough for them to really unpack the discussion, mm -hmm. which is really tough. Like I, on one hand, I think psychedelics are resilient in that they're, you know, at least psilocybin is very cheap and easy to make. Um, so even if you get a patent and the protocol is going to cost you. I don't know, six to ten thousand dollars US, like, you know, you could still grow this stuff and do it essentially for free if you found the right friends. But it's a really tricky conversation because it's very different. So like you've been looking at this. Has there been any kind of model that you've you've seen that was really interesting to you, like a co op or something or No, but this just the fact that you mentioned it's really easy and cheap to grow uh, psilocybin in the form of, of mushrooms or truffles. I recently spoke to, um, um, to Angelo Zaga Velder, who's a clinical uh, psychologist in Mexico, and they're planning to do a clinical trial looking at the treatment of uh, refractory depression. And she mentioned they, they got permission from the Autonomous University of, of Mexico, which is the biggest and the most renowned university in Mexico. And she mentioned that even in Mexico, which is kind of the birthplace of the traditional ceremonial use of of mushrooms for healing, they have to they have to use GMP psilocybin, oh. which is <laughs> psilocybin manufactured under the you know good manufacturing practices. Uh, so it's a gold standard for pharmaceutical medicine. But it's interesting that even even in a, in this country where where it is used traditionally and historically, they still have to comply with Western Western scientific standards. Mm. So I think I think it's I mean. And this is this is already an interesting discussion that we can dedicate the rest of this podcast to. This is a consequence of the of the process of medicalization, right? If mm. you if you want to make psychedelics available for the treatment of uh, of recognized psychiatric or med medical disorders, then you will have to follow this process, which means you will need GMP psilocybin, which means it will be expensive, mm. uh, which has consequences for for possibly for the for the accessibility of of psychedelic. Right. It's interesting. They, um, I would love to have seen it with like three groups, like a control GMP and then mushroom. And then that way mm -hmm. we have like three areas to, to analyze. We know mushrooms aren't dangerous. So it's like, come on. You know, I, I do understand that people in academia have a really, you know, their, their careers are often on the line with what they propose 
for their research yeah. pilots to be like, Hey, we would love to do this, but, but no, cause you might risk your tenure or something like that. It would, it would be nice for there to be some sort of like partnership with people who have already done the work maybe. But, you know, yeah. I know their IRBs and all this stuff with publishing like certain sets of data is really problematic, but it yeah. shouldn't, it should also, it, I mean, it should not be impossible. If you look at the, um, there are clinical studies with cannabis and cannabis is a natural product. I mean, in the Netherlands, there's a company that grows cannabis under really rigor, rigorous standards for medicinal use. We have a, we have an official industry of health license bureau for medicinal cannabis. Mm. So you could also probably standardize standardized natural products um like like psilocybin containing mushrooms or truffles right so there's no there's no reason it, it it cannot be done i think yeah that's a great point let's hope people kind of edge in that direction i would love to see that yeah yeah and accessibility i you know we're we're going through an interesting election cycle and and like the the brexit thing kind of just seems like it's finalizing more and more and the NHS kind of dissolving. So it seems like we are having this kind of crisis in the healthcare anyway, almost globally. It seems like that to me anyway, but you know, yeah, your point is, is well taken. Like if this is going to be the treatment, how are we going to be able to help people afford it? You know, we're in early days right now. So I, I don't necessarily think that it, we need to figure this out like this year but we do need to, like you're saying, have this conversation and kind of explore more about this. And you know, yeah, I think it, I think I think you might be underestimating how how quickly these things go. If you if you look at the amount of, I just regularly come up. Uh, I, I see new startups, biomed startups, or biotech startups. Right, that, there's that a lot of them. Right interested now. in psychedelics. They, yeah, they're like they're proliferating. <laughs> hey, I see new ones popping up all the time, and the, the same thing happened when suddenly cannabis uh, became, or medical medical cannabis became available in in one state and then in two states and three and four, five, six, seven. Mm. Uh, now now it's legal in several countries, and you know that's 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 be, be, become completely capitalized upon. I mean, the same people who were opposed to cannabis or any any of the recreational recreational substances suddenly jumped jumped on board and Philip Morris is buying into into cannabis into, into the cannabis industry and there's no I mean there's no reason a priori why that cannot also happen with psychedelics I think and it can happen more quickly than you think right so it's a, it's a really it's a, it's a really interesting it's a really interesting time to be in I mean it, it's happening so quickly and for people like you uh, who've been involved with psychedelics for a long time, you know, for, for the longest time, this has been a, like a group of, like a pretty intimate group of interested psychedelics who shared this fascination and interest for, for this relatively obscure subject. Right. And all of a sudden you get this crisis in, in psychiatry and, and research uh, into psychedelics is, is growing and it's increasing. And all of a sudden it, it may, you know, grow beyond anyone's control. Right. Right. It's, it's, it is accelerating like crazy. I saw that all these companies now are spinning up in Jamaica to find novel pharmaceuticals inside cubensis mushrooms and, and beyond and try to patent them for therapeutic use. It's, it's a really weird situation. I, I don't know how to <clears throat> really relate to it because it's, it's so foreign to me, but like, I like to, I guess I don't understand the medical model enough to to understand like why you couldn't just say, oh, you've you know perhaps these mushrooms would be good for this indication to sidestep a patent, you know, or like um, theoretically, did you, did you, if just, LSD was prescribable, you could do almost everything you can do with mushrooms with LSD, almost. True. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see that they? I, I don't know if that was a hoax or not, but that somebody came up with a a nasal spray with psilocybin or right. like the. Is all mushrooms also in Jamaica or something? Right, that was a company. <laughs> they were they were aiming that as a microdose, so they're trying to right. work to prove that it would be a good thing for microdosing for depression. Um, but mm -hmm. you know they've got a few. <laughs> um, I don't know. They've got some research time left before I think they can secure that. But I think they did the patent, so. and then they have to do all the research. 
because you right. want to patent it to protect protect yourself before you but you could just eat the mushrooms but you know i i think it's like um people are used to all these weird kind of ingestion methods so they're just trying to go for it like I, I imagine there could be transdermal psilocybin eventually, you know, if they've found a tech, who knows, right? Like, why not? So, yeah. So like, we're going to see a lot of weird stuff that's going to make us as like a, a psychedelic culture in a sense, um, uncomfortable. There's plenty coming up <laughs> and there's yeah. already been plenty. That's that's happened. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, in terms of patent, I mean, th these are things that you can patent novel administration methods. Like very very recently, Janssen Janssen Pharmaceuticals they 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 patented a, a nasal nasal spray Spravato uh, with ketamine, and they can charge ridiculously high prices. You now ketamine has been off label for for uh, off patent for years and years, but this way, I mean, you can you can develop a new route of administration, you can patent it, and then make a lot of money. Right. Get FDA approval. Yeah. Like the, because they had the money to put it through the process, they were able to, and it's not really different from ketamine, according to a lot of people. It's just like the left-handed molecules are one of the variants. So it's the same drug in essence. And with an inferior route of administration, apparently, which is good to know, um, compared to IV, IM, or lozenge. For sure. So like yeah. the dosage just isn't as predictable. So that's that's quite the situation too. I don't but you know they had the money to go through the process. So how do we fix that process? Is the trick, I guess. That's a that's a, that's a really good question. Yeah, yeah. Because it's only industry bringing stuff through the process. So like, you know, I don't know. Is there some sort of international drug development group that can help? <laughs> you know, maybe that would be cool. Yeah, I, yeah. I, this is this is something that I also don't know, but I think yeah, it would be great to have a more in depth discussion on because. It is. It is what is happening, and this may, maybe, maybe it's in the end it will turn out to be not such a big problem, but there is there is a risk that, I mean, it, just to take this example of ketamine, the, the the prices that they're charging for for dosages of ketamine, and now having an FDA approved medication for the treatment of depression means that they uh, can recommend it to doctors, which means that doctors will have to charge these high prices, which especially in the in the U.S. I mean, we don't have the same crisis in, uh, in uh, public health care funding to do in the U.S. But um, this this has direct results in terms of accessibility. Mm. And this could, this could theoretically also happen um, with psychedelics. Right, right. I would hope we find workarounds, but you're right. Like the a ketamine infusion in the U.S. would run anywhere from like 300 to $900. And then with a Spravato treatment, I believe is like two to two to four thousand dollars. You have to do it in a very specific clinic, so only licensed clinics can administer it. And uh, yeah, they've really got it on lockdown. When you could make, you know, a, a compounding pharmacy can literally make the same drug for, you know, almost a hundredth of the price. So it's it's quite the scam they've got going, <laughs> but they were it, able to yeah. use the legal system to their advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for keeping that that kind of stuff on the radar. It's it's quite the. You're right that we could probably talk about that for a long time, and I'm happy too yeah. if that's like something that that's really um, close to your interest set. Like, have you have you seen anybody problem solving on it in particular that you've been excited about, or I've not it's, seen no, any good solutions yet, other than no, expensive cent centers to go to for sessions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and as, as, I, as I said, in the Netherlands, it's, n it's not an option. Uh, there, there are a couple of places that provide off-label treatment with ketamine for depression in the Netherlands, and this is covered covered by healthcare. Um, I mean, you have to you have to talk to your patient's healthcare provider, but it is uh, it can be it can be covered. Um, right. So we, we we don't know have that problem yet. Uh, okay. Yet. <laughs> I did. I think I just saw that Spravato is making it to to the UK, um, which is pretty interesting. I wonder, I wonder what happened there. You know, after <laughs> they dissolved NHS, they said, let's get Spravato in there. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> who knows? Yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. what else about the conference, uh, is go is like pretty cool. Um, 
the one, one thing that I'm that I'm also excited about that I and that I also find a little scary at the same time is where um, we express this ambition to bring a couple of indigenous practitioners to the conference and to not 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 only to have a like an in-depth discussion about uh, about psychedelics between people from a Western perspective and people who've used these substances traditionally for, uh, you know, for decades and centuries. But also, I think it's important because so many new, new people are becoming interested in this field that may have no idea that psilocybin uh, as, a, as a pharmaceutical product is, is derived from psilocybin as found in mushrooms and it's being used uh, for such a long time for, for different purposes, not just for medicinal purposes, but for different purposes. And we we wanted to bring a couple of practitioners to, to bring this across, and to have to have a to have a good discussion. And and the reason that I find it a little scary at the same time is that I really hope to do it in a that we're able to do this in a way that is not um, tokenistic. They say, okay, so we're doing a conference on psychedelics. We put somebody in stage in this uh, in their costume, their their headdress, and then we stick the we stick the indigenous box. But to do it in a way that is um, mutually mutually beneficial, so that doesn't mean that we'll just extract knowledge, which has happened obviously for you know for I know as long as colonization has happened, um, not as a way of extracting knowledge, but as a reciprocal conversation that that will have mutual benefits, and that's something we're we're still in the process of uh, of talking to people to finding the right format to have these discussions. Because that's an, that's another that's another aspect of it. You know, scientific conferences, people who present are usually accustomed to giving short, concise, structured presentations that last twenty to twenty five minutes, half an hour. People people who don't come from a Western perspective or a scientific perspective, they have a really different idea about about communication, about conversations, and sometimes you know it can last for hours and days, and. Yeah, the challenge for us is to find a um, find a format that that falls somewhere in the middle, so that that addresses both perspectives, both worldviews, both languages. Not just not just the, the actual languages people speak, but the language in terms of you know worldview and cosmology of people from a from a back, background um, uh, in in North or South America. Um, and that of, of people who come from a scientific background. So it's something that I, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about, but that I also realize needs a lot of care to, to be done correctly. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't even know how to start, but it's, it's pretty great that you're doing that. And, you know, I've been around this topic for a long time and for me on the show, it's been just asking questions and, you know, no declaratives from me. Just kind of yeah. like making a platform and, and inviting them to to do them on the show, and it's it is challenging. It's certainly a little scary too because I don't want to do it wrong. I want to be as respect, respectful as I can, and um, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. I'm glad you're taking a similar approach. It's great. Yeah, I think it's, I, I think it's important to to acknowledge this, this aspect, and mm. that one of one of the other challenges is also that there's a lot of. Um, ethical and political dimensions to this um, that I'm, I'm not 100% sure will be understood by people who just who just sit in lab studying studying cell biology or the pharmacology so that's I mean that's another challenge that we we really think we can we can we can do justice uh, and, and in some cases it may also just be enough to to I think acknowledge this and to to show what the what the difficulties can be and how to do this right because I know there are people there will be people um, presenting at the conference who are doing research together with indigenous communities and who who can share what what methodological and ethical and logistical issues they face and how to how to um, how to surmount these and just sharing that it can be done and 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 how it can be done properly. And I think that in itself will be interesting. And then, in addition, another aspect that I think will be pretty interesting is just talking about concepts, concepts of healing 
and approaches approaches of healing and what elements in healing and in, in providing psychedelics in a in a ritual way are conducive to healing and how those differ between uh, the practices of indigenous communities and of, of the people that are currently developing these in the West. So I think that's a really interesting discussion and conversation to be had as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's so much to learn still. Um, the, yeah. I think, you know, a lot of folks believe that what Hopkins is doing is like Johns Hopkins with the psilocybin research and the therapy, like that's the best thing going. But I, I think there's so many things that could be added. But again, this is a research situation, not necessarily like the optimal end outcome. So it's mm -hmm. up to everybody to keep, you know, keep learning and keep evolving this stuff. And if you can do research, great. If you want to just keep learning, that's also great. But yeah, conferences like this will help kind of broaden that conversation. And that's why I think conferences are really important to the field because people get stuck. And yeah. you're like, oh, but those shamans are doing this. I wonder why. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I wonder why. I mean, that's always a, a right question to ask. And also, I mean, it's, 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 that, that's another thing I think we hope to bring to the, uh, to the conference is not just having discussions on, on, on research and research findings, but also on, on practices. So as you, as you said, I mean, the Johns Hopkins model, having a, having a, 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 a diet of, of guides, a male-female diet, uh, having somebody laid down with eye shades and a headset on and a music playlist. I mean, that's, that's the basic psychedelic therapy model. But yeah, that I mean, it's just it really is just one model, and that model does seem to be working well, and it's it seems to be safe and effective. But I mean, maybe there are different methods that work equally well, and that may work better for different groups of people. Right. So there's yeah, no end to the research that we need to do. Really, that's so. a good thing. <laughs> if you're a researcher, you got decades and decades left. Um, for sure. Yeah, yeah. and you know. I, I like this idea of going a little bit beyond um, mental health, but like actually looking at pure psychology or like pure, you know, neurobiology or whatever. Um, I, I just think that's fascinating and will have so many amazing benefits downstream um, in terms of, you know, medical interventions and, and whatever else, you know, transhumanist weird stuff, but there's all sorts of angles. Um, and it seems like you have a couple neuroimaging people coming. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. I'm always fascinated to see like the new the new data, but you know, my my orientation is always more like de I feel like I function like Freud and Jung and when I model things, but I know that that doesn't work for other people. So I always have to like go, okay, they believe this. I'm like, okay, cool. But it's nice to have all these different lenses to flip through. Um there was actually a presentation at Horizons uh where one psychiatrists shared that a lot of these things were we have to couch them as hypotheses so like uh you know the neuro the neurochemical balance hypothesis kind of like the the depth psychology hypothesis like the structural hypothesis it was really interesting and there i think he named six and these are like all the different ways of looking at these illnesses or problems that people have and no one really has proven itself dominantly over the others yet yeah, the same, the same, the same for looking looking at the brain. I think you know there's all these amazing techniques, but really, if you look at it in a bit of a broader picture, it's really just in its infancy mm. to see how we can learn what, um, what what all these neuroimaging techniques can tell us. And then also, I mean, uh, in all honesty, my perspective, I'm I'm trained in philosophy and I, I do qualitative research, so. Uh, like it's a it's a whole language that I don't completely understand. I I, I understand a little bit in the context of psychedelics, mm. but it's not it's not it's not my field at all. And I'm I'm personally much more interested in, you know, the stories that people tell, the experiences that they report, and and the psychological the psychological aspects of it. But I know that there's so much interesting stuff going on in the in the neuroscience world as well. So, mm. and that's where a lot of the new 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 interesting research results come from as well so it's really important to have that yeah absolutely agree 
and what what kind of facility is this in? Is this like a, an opera hall or something, or kind of like a nice meeting space? Or yeah, it's a beautiful. It's a it's a music. It's called the Philharmony. It's a Philharmony place. It's a, a music music hall that usually has lots of classical concerts. Mm. And um, the, the the second the second biggest room is a is this beautiful wooden curved space that is ideal for uh, for musical sessions. Mm-hmm. But it's one thing also that we're that we're still thinking of um, is of holding a, a session on music in this space because the, the venue itself is so ideally suited to to do something with music. And music plays such an important role in in psychedelic ceremonies and psychedelic treatment. So it would be really nice to be able to use that room to its to its to its utmost capacity. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really cool. That'd be really nice. I, I wonder what you could do. There's probably too many options when you start thinking about it. But um, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, that's that, that's a, that's the thing with psychedelics. Even if you limit yourself to, you know, scientific aspects of it, I mean, there's so much. There's so much going on. So many different angles that you can take. That we also usually we don't we don't pick a topic or a theme for the conference because uh, I mean. There is there is so much going on that it's hard to fit on a one theme that is that is not just the interdisciplinary scientific study of of, um, of psychedelics. Mm. Yeah, I, <laughs> you're you're right though. Like this this idea of like how do we keep these researchers and and, and medical professionals interested, even if we include psychedelic art, because it's like the the culture probably makes them uncomfortable and i think so you know for mainstream for mainstream scientists yeah it has to be as close to a to a a scientific conference um as as people are used to i think right for people who don't come from an inherent inherent uh interest in psychedelics they they come because there are interesting implications for the study of consciousness or mental disorders or because they they found some interesting uh anthropological research um, or they're interested in, from a clinical perspective, they might be turned down by uh, by, by the cultural aspect of psychedelics. Even if they are, these are like pretty interwoven uh, for many people. Yeah, it's interesting. I really wonder what that is. It's just like the conservative nature of kind of academia. <clears throat> they want to be taken seriously. So, like like you said, if somebody has you know tattoos, long hair, a big beard, and dress is funny. Like they, that's probably not who they're going to go to for information. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and it's um, yeah, that's it's a lesson I think folks should learn. You know, if you if you want to be effective in X Y Z ways, perhaps you have to conform a little bit. Because there's a lot of people out there, especially in the U.S., like that just go really far out, and and you know perhaps that's good, but it doesn't necessarily translate to any kind of meaningful change in their community because they're not being taken seriously by influential people. People have social clout. Yeah. yeah and I, I really do think that's important to take into consideration. Right. I mean, I, I think if you want to focus on, on, on psychedelic culture, art, music, then organize, organize a festival. If you want to do a scientific conference, then organize a scientific conference. If you want to do both, I, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little complicated either way. Right. The MAPS 2017, the MAPS 2017 conference in Oakland was really great because it was um, like that psychedelic culture angle was really kind of perhaps ice. Well, I can't even say that. I was going to say it was like really isolated. There was a lot of small academic rooms that looked kind of dry, like normal hotel ballrooms with where scientific mm-hmm. conferences would happen. But um, the stage that had that hosted a lot of like the culture stuff was always mixed in with kind of poster sessions and also kind of merchants. Um, so it was a really interesting thing. And I, I wonder how a lot of the scientists and, and medical professionals related to that. It's probably their first taste. And it was a big I conference too. too. I think it was a little bit bigger than what you're doing, but I don't know. Like you're, you're at about a 2000 person conference um or how no it's a it's 1000 at most okay cool I f- yeah i really forget the number of people at that california conference but it was i think it might have been around 2000 something that sounds about right and it, it was yeah. really big perhaps you know i think it was the biggest at that point so it's like 
perhaps a little bigger than it should be uh, for like the sweet spot, but it was like the, the their big conference. So I guess the mm-hmm. size made sense. That's why it's not every year. It's, a, it's also a hell of a job to organize yeah. a conference. I always in, underestimated. So that's why it always takes a couple of years before we're eager to do one again. Because <laughs> after it's done, it's like, oh, no, never again. <laughs> and then after a year, you start, okay, maybe, maybe do one more. <laughs> What is your is, team? How many people do you have on your team right now? 25 to 30 ish. Wow. That's incredible. Nice yeah, we have an amazing, we really do have an amazing team. Very talented people from really diverse backgrounds, both culturally and uh, academically as well. And it's all, I mean, it's a, it's a big volunteer effort for people. So the, I mean, the, the team, this team size shifts a little bit over the course of the, over, over the, course of the year right yeah but we, we have an amazing team they're all they're all on the website as well all right great we've yeah we got connected through through jasmine which is great she's been a, a really cool person to be interacting with and um i think i've linked up with a couple other people from your team so really excited nice. to get to know them a little bit more too mm-hmm. yeah very cool and is the do you, does the open foundation have an office or are you kind of distributed so the, the office that I'm, I'm the only I'm the only paid employee. I'm I'm paid part time, and the uh, the office that I'm sitting in is my office, which is my home. Excellent. It's <laughs> <laughs> really good. Yeah, and I, I think one 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 other thing I, I just realized that um, I think I, I really wanted to to mention um, that we're going to do at the conference, which I which I'm really excited about excited about is we have one of the lead therapists of the. Um, of the Imperial Psilocybin for Depression study, will bring a patient to the conference. Oh. So we'll get to sh- we'll get to get perspectives from the therapist and the patient both. So we'll find a find a way to do an interview with both of them, so they can both share their perspectives. And I think that's so valuable because you usually do get outside perspectives, which I mean, for clinical people, clinical observations are really important, but to get somebody's inside perspective, I think will be hugely, hugely insightful. And I'm, I'm, that's something that I'm really looking forward to as well. We did an episode like that with a therapist and patient um, from the MAPS MDMA trial, and it was an extraordinary episode. Lori Tipton was the lady's name, so if anybody wants to listen to that. It's just so amazing to hear these stories. It's really impressive. Yeah, I want. I want to listen to that episode now as well. <laughs> Sorry, Tipton. Yep, yep. She's an incredible yep. person. She's really public, and I, I forget the therapist's name. Sherry, maybe Sherry something, but they're they're out of New Orleans, and it, it's quite the extraordinary story of like a before and after from that person's perspective. Apparently, that episode is used in some university classrooms to teach qualitative analysis. So, oh, wow. <laughs> so I found that out not that long ago. Um, really, really cool. Um, mm-hmm. so, well, that's awesome. You're doing that. I think they did a similar thing with, I think it was another MDMA participant, uh, research participant and it was at horizons. I think the guy's name was Tim Blackwell maybe. And that was a really extraordinary kind of, um, story he was able to share there, you know, war veteran, a lot of trauma. And, um, was it, was it Nick? Nick sounds right. Blackwell, maybe he was featured in a book as well. I forget which one. Yeah, though. I think I think it was Nick. He had a he had long hair and a kind of goatee, but yeah. he ended up become an artist. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly the story. Yeah, <laughs> nice. That, yeah, that's amazing. His story is amazing. It's also kind of like an example of how psychedelics, or in this case MDMA, can kind of turn you into a hippie. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it just don't tell the scientists. Really different from his veteran self afterwards. <laughs> so um, that's actually a good point. Like, how do we use this these kind of n of one stories to to kind of influence the narrative, or you know, are they helpful even? And like, I I often see you know business case studies presented as you know just that case studies, even though it's not necessarily the sweet spot of like the bell curve indicating like, this is what you do. And Mm -hmm. you know, how do you, how do you relate to this like kind of qualitative stuff in these, these stories and, and how do we, do you have any kind of clever ways of using them? 
No, but I, I think stories are much more convincing, even to even to hardcore scientists. They they have much more of an of a, of a direct emotional impact on people, uh, and I think that that really stays with people for a much longer time. Even saying you know, eighty percent eighty percent symptom reduction after seven years is, is still impressive. It just it it doesn't have the same emotional impact. And there's there's this Israeli documentary called Trip of Compassion, which follows the um, three three people with PTSD through through their um, MDMA assisted psychotherapy, um, MDMA assisted psychotherapy. Um, it, it enacts, reenacts some of their uh, incidents in their lives, and they actually use footage of the MDMA therapy sessions in the documentary. Mm. And I've seen it. I've I've seen the documentary three times now, and each time I was just as emotionally blown away as I was uh, as I was uh, uh, the, the times before. It's just really. It's really powerful and i think that has the stories people's personal stories touching emotional stories they really have an impact to to bring something across that that pure research data just cannot so i think it's really it's really important to show what what effect it can have on people's lives and how people how people change and that's usually not captured in you know statistical analysis right i have a this is tangential, but it illustrates your point. I, I have a friend who did graduate research on birds, and he was ta- talking to me <clears throat> about all these fringe cases. You know, I, I had been studying psychedelic stuff for a really long time, so it was interesting to hear about these fringe cases in other fields where these bird, some birds, like ravens in particular, and some ravens can ex- express extraordinary intelligence that you wouldn't expect from a bird. But because it doesn't fit into the bell curve very much, you're kind of like cut off your 5% exceptions on either side. Because what, you know, I, I think it confuses the story, but I think those stories are also really helpful. And maybe that's yeah, why we that, like people like William James and Oliver Sacks and, and others who talk about these edge cases and Groff too. Yeah, and they, I mean, they, they, they are real. They exist, even mm-hmm. if they don't they're not in the mean or they're not in the average. It doesn't mean that they're, they're not there. I think that's something that really struck me early in this field that there's really some, some huge paradigm bending stuff on the periphery. And, and just because Groff wrote about it doesn't mean that you're going to have that experience, but it also doesn't mean that he's lying. Right? Like that I, at one point I had to go, okay, is this guy lying to me? Like, is this book just full of bullshit? And I'm like, I, no, like I met, I met enough people that trusted him and all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, these things happened. I don't know what to really do with it, but you know, I think that's part of the magic here. It's like, there's these magical stories and we've got to figure out how to contextualize them for ourselves. Some people, some people join various religions. Other people just think about it a lot or perhaps just don't even think about it. They're like, okay, that was a little strange. I'm just going to not <laughs> act as if yeah. that actually happened. Yeah, and then that, 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 that struck something in me. I, I think if you if you think about it, um, people's experiences with psychedelics, especially in, in the, uh, or maybe not even just in a in a treatment context, but they are really just a collection of n is ones. I mean, one person's experience may com- may be completely different from the from the next person's. They may have they may have you know clinically and statistically similar uh, similar outcomes if you're talking about healthcare treatment but their experiences may be completely disparate and they may have they may have they may both have had depression or they may both have had PTSD but I mean their lives their lives have been completely different their uh, experiences have been different and then their treatment experiences vary wildly as well so that's another reason why I think it's really important to have these to have these stories so people get a sense of what it can be like to to have to have a psychedelic experience and what it what it can mean for for you as a person but also for the treatment of, of, of the disorder that you may have. And especially for people who come from outside of this field, I think that's yeah, that's incredible. It's incredibly important to share. And I I also think we want to share some of the negative stories too, just so that doctors know that we're not embellishing. Like, hey, there's there's also some bad cases once in a while, but that's in our current context, right? Like we can't really 
we don't have ultimate flexibility, I think, as facilitators or as researchers. We've got to really stick to this one protocol. So like we know that this protocol can have these potential negative ramifications for this small portion of the population that goes through. Like there's there's definitely people have committed suicide after psychedelic sessions for sure. Um, maybe not that day, maybe a couple days later, but you know, there have been deaths and we have to take that seriously. Uh, yeah, I fully agree. It's, it's disingenuous to do otherwise. And you don't, I, I don't think you do the credibility or of this field any, any favors if you don't, if you don't take this seriously. And I think it should be, it should be addressed as well. Right. Yeah. And <clears throat> I understand why it's hidden right now to a degree, but I do think we just need to be a little bit more open. You know, I love the name of your foundation, Open Foundation. I think there's something there. And, and sure. you know, it's open science. What, you know, it's open, sh just a, a culture of sharing. And, yeah. you know, just keeping the conversation going. And there's value there as opposed to closed science all for one patent. Um, yeah. We all could get yeah. much more if we had that data sooner. Yeah. Well, yeah, there you go. But it's a, it's a whole different discussion on open science for sure. <laughs> but I mean, just, just to, to, to further emphasize your point about, you know, the dark side, the, the negative experiences, if you have all this collection of this wild variation of, of experiences that people have, this definitely includes negative experiences as well. And in some cases, negative outcomes too. And this can happen. And if you don't, if you don't share this and if you don't discuss this, I mean, there's no way you can learn from it. And there's no way other people can learn from it. So I really do think that it's important to to also keep keep addressing this. It, it's, it happens. It's, uh, there, there there are ways of dealing with this. And there's ways of learning from it. But always always remain open and honest about this. Right. I there's there's a kind of undercurrent of. <clears throat> don't share that story. It's bad for the movement. And it's like, well, you know, depending on what you, you happened, think, you know, you've got to be really careful there. Yeah. I think it's, it's okay to call out um, people who are doing bad stuff, just name bad practices, or at least try to have a conversation. But it's a whole, it's a whole ball of wax. Very. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's something that we'll address at our conference as well. You know, ethics of doing research, ethics of ethical dilemmas, uh, ethical, ethical uh, aspects to take into account when doing therapy, when doing research. Right. I, I guess I, one, one last kind of question. I, I don't know if that you'll have an answer, but this is something that's been going on for me for a while. Academia seems to have kind of like a lock on this research. And there are also these pharma companies now that are entering the fray. Do you see any kind of role for like citizen science where people, you know, maybe a small company could publish data with you know and share what's going on there and you know is that helpful or does it really need to be from a university well it, yeah, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a tough one i think you know our our perspective has always been to to work from within the mainstream mainstream academia mainstream science mm. and it's hard enough if you if you if you're a subject of interest in psychedelics it's hard enough to be taken seriously in the first place so our perspective has always been, so we'll do it from within the accepted parameters of, of academia, of, of, of science, and we'll work from within and um, keep showing scientists, scholars, that this is a topic worthy, uh, worthy of uh, exploration. Mm -hmm. But that, I mean, it doesn't mean that there aren't other legitimate uh, scientific endeavors uh, such as citizen science. I know that the... Um, the DMT Nexus, for example, they did a whole, whole interesting. They, they have done a bunch of projects up, um, mm -hmm. studying, studying plants, studying substances uh, that were all from from people's own interests outside of academia. That had some really interesting results. So there's definitely worth there. There's no reason why that shouldn't be shouldn't be explored as well. But from from our perspective, we've always, as I said, we try to be under boring tend towards the boring side, the, the, the accepted mainstream side of things, um, just in order for people to surpass their prejudices and, and, and 
preconceived notions of, of psychedelics as, you know, either dangerous or, or as uninteresting for, for scientific purposes. You know, all the, all the, all the stigmas that, and, 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 and prejudices that people have related to psychedelics, which is diminishing a lot, uh, I find, these last years. But it's, that's always, that's always been there. Right. And I think as more and more people get communicating about this on the internet, we're going to see more citizen science just in general. So I, I hope scientists at the very least review it <laughs> so they know, you know, where they might want to go in the future with their studies. Um, the DMT Nexus is a great example of that. There's a number of mushroom websites that have great stuff too. So it's, it's quite the subject area for, for research. So I'm excited. So do you know, is this, is this, is this, are, are people doing this citizen science attempting to publish in, in, in regular journals as well? Or is this, I don't also think so. Published? No? If, from what I understand, if you're going to publish in a uh, standard journal, you'd need a IRB. So you'd need some sort of ethics board to review your work. And then you could. You probably also need some sort of university sponsor to get even on the radar of the, the group. So it wouldn't necessarily need to be a university, just a single person with a, a name attached to a university. I've, I've been looking at doing some stuff like this, but, you know, it's as a, you know, we're not a nonprofit, so are people really going to give us money to do research? I don't think so. Like, once once we have enough funds, we easily self-fund, but that's going to take a little bit. Um, and it's, you know, it's not for ROI because I'm not making nasal, you know, nasal LSD, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, people are doing it, and it's really cool. I, It's mostly just putting it out online. For whatever reason, everybody's moved to Facebook from a lot of these forums, which I think has its own problems. But, you know, <laughs> if you're okay with the internet or the, uh, I don't know, Facebook police knowing everything about you, I guess that's fine. So, yeah, depending on the, on the, on the focus or the scope of your research, I'm not sure if that's a wiser decision. To correct. Move to correct. correct. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Cool. Well, where can people learn more about the conference and the Open Foundation? So for the conference, go to icpr2020.net for speakers, program tickets, everything. And Open Foundation is openfoundation.nl. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. Well, Joost, I really appreciate you joining us today. It's been fun and um, even more excited to come to the conference now. So Yeah, looking forward to meeting you in person. And thanks for waking up early for me. <laughs> you got it. Anytime. And there you have it. Joost Brekshima from ICPR 2020. Visit the website icpr2020.net for more information. And this conference is in April 2020, kind of, uh, I think, the weekend after 420. Um, we're going to be in Europe for a conference before that on philosophy and psychedelics. And the following weekend, we'll be, or I will personally be at ICPR 2020. Um, Kyle, I believe, will be over at the Chakruna conference happening in San Francisco. So thank you, Yush, for having us as media partners. Really excited to have more of your speakers join us on the podcast. And um, again, if you're interested in psychedelics, you want to dig deeper into the science of psychedelics, maybe come to this conference, see how things are looking. Um, very, very excited to be a part of it and, and be there. Um, again, the podcast is brought to you by Onnit, O-N-N-I-T dot com, a fantastic supplement and fitness company and food company. A lot of great things on there. Uh, to try out if you want to experiment with some new food products check it out and you can save 10 percent by using code psy today at checkout psy today at onnit.com they're also brought to you by audible and you can get a free month trial over there by going to audibletrial.com slash psychedelics today and there's tons of great books tons 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 of great books um one of the cool perks that i, I haven't really shared about the audible subscription is they started doing um, Audible Originals, and they're kind of short, five or less hours typically, and you get one, you, know, you get two free shorts per month. I learned a ton from one of their recent ones on CTE, what's it called? Uh, the full name for CTE is Chronic Traumatic Encephalopathy, maybe. It's like um, brain damage, chronic traumatic brain injury can lead to this thing called CTE, which is horrific. It's um, 
not very super well understood yet, but a lot of American football players are getting it. There is um UK soccer slash football guy who had a really tragic case of CTE. A lot of these people end up doing a lot of violence and killing themselves. It's really, really ugly. This early, very extraordinarily early onset dementia. Anyway, that's the CTE thing. It was really helpful for me to understand CTE better. They had it's almost like journalism at times. And sometimes you can get short fiction too. Like I, I bought a got a young adult fiction book about space travel. <laughs> and it was pretty fun too. It's great stuff. So check it out, audibletrial.com slash psychedelics today. And you can get a free month trial, some free one free audiobook. And if you choose to continue, I'm sure you get these uh, audible original shorts that are that are really, really great. Sometimes famous authors will just do one. I, I think Michael Pollan has one coming up on caffeine or coffee or something. And pretty excited about that. Yeah, I think that's it for now. Um, thank you all for tuning in to Psychedelics today. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Yosh from ICPR 2020. We'll see you on the next episode. Have a great rest of your week. Bye-bye. <laughs>